Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. When you think about Union Civil War generals, the soldier pictured here, Neil Dow, is not a name that is top of mind. Dow had a long career as a politician and as a staunch advocate for prohibition. He was born in Maine, a Quaker by faith, and he was nicknamed the Napoleon of Temperance for his crusade against the evils of alcohol. By the start of the Civil War in 1861, Dow was 57 years old, had risen to prominence, and was probably at the pinnacle of his career. He didn't plan to fight in the army. He planned to stay at home and take care of his elder father. But for men of Dow's stature, being leaders, politicians, you really didn't have a choice to sit on the sidelines. That wasn't an option. This was a war where everyone had to stand up and be counted, and Dow was no exception. He became a colonel in the 13th Maine Infantry and went on to become a brigadier. That was in 1861. Now I want to flash forward and take you to May 27th, 1863, and the siege of Port Hudson along the Mississippi River in Louisiana. The Union commander, Nathaniel Banks, had ordered an assault to break the Confederate lines and hopefully end the siege. Dow was not happy about this attack. He did not think that it would succeed but he was now a soldier and had to obey the orders of his superiors. Dow was right. The assault did not work. It did not succeed. It ended with the Confederates shooting him twice as he and his troops advanced across Slaughter's Field. One bullet hit him in the right arm. It was a spent ball. The second bullet tore through his thigh, taking him out of action. He was carried to safety by his men and sent to a hospital to recuperate. Some weeks passed before he was able to get up and move about and ride a horse. On June 30th, 1863, about a few weeks, uh, well, more than a few weeks after his shooting, he set out on horseback to visit his troops. Later that night, as he returned to the hospital, a Confederate cavalry patrol caught him, captured him. And he spent the next eight months as a prisoner of war, much of that time in Libby prison. He was eventually exchanged in February of 1864 for Confederate General William Henry Fitzhugh Lee, the son of General Robert E. Lee. Dow was back to the safety of Union lines, but his health had been compromised and would never quite be the same again. Before the end of 1864, he returned to Maine and was going to live out the rest of his, his days there. Now, I want to flash forward again, this time 30, more than 30 years later, to October 2nd, 1897. On that fall day, a letter arrived at Dow's home in Portland, Maine. The letter was written by a man he didn't know, and it was focused on that singular event 34 years earlier, that May 27th, 1863, failed assault on Port Hudson. The letter writer was a former Confederate colonel. His name was Thomas J. Reed, Jr., and he served, he was the commander of the 12th Arkansas Infantry. Reed happened to be on the opposite side of the battlefield of Dow and his Union troops. In the letter that he wrote to Dow, he described the role that he played in shooting Dow down as he rode across the field. Here's an excerpt from Reed's letter. He writes, quote, on the morning of the assault on Port Hudson, you, with one or two mounted officers in the midst of your brigade, columns and regimental front in the broad open field of Slaughter's Plantation, 
or directing the deployment of your regiments into line of battle about four to 600 yards from my position, which was the right center of our line of earthworks in front of Slaughter's residence. I observed closely your movements until I was enabled to know that you were the commanding officer. Reed continued, quote, I assembled a small number of my sharpshooters and singled you out to them and ordered them to fire continuously at you. After a short time, your line of battle was formed and a general advance on my position was commenced with drums beating and flags flying, presenting a magnificent line, grandly marching to time in perfect order. It was a picture never to be erased from my mind. For with all the military pomp and display in formidable battle array, I knew the dreadful fate I held in hand to turn it into defeat with the terrible slaughter of that day's battle. Reed, and Reed added, quote, the scattering of fire from my sharpshooters continued while the roar of your cannon sent shells over our heads. When about 300 yards from my position, I saw you fall or lean down to your horse's neck and a number of your hospital corps ran and lifted you from your horse. The colonel concluded his letter. Reed said, quote, your command never faltered but swept on in splendid line until within 80 yards of my position when I ordered my battalion to fire you directed the charge of your brigade, and it swept along like an avalanche until forced to retreat from the galling fire of my command, so well protected by our strong breastworks. But the retreat of your brigade was orderly. So that was the end of Reed's letter. Can you imagine 34, later, 34 years later, after you've been hit by two bullets in battle, that you get a letter from the man who ordered the sharpshooters on the opposite side to shoot you down? Well, that's where we are on this October 2nd, 1897. And you might be wondering, how did Dow respond to Reed's letter? Well, he didn't. Because on that same day, in his home in Portland, Dow died. He died the same day that the letter arrived. In fact, it's not known if he ever saw it. I imagine he never did. So Dow likely went to his death, never reading the note from Reed, that reminiscence that explained to him how he came to be wounded. In fact, Reed had written the letter after reading news reports that Dow's health was failing. In fact, Dow had been critically ill for some time, and Reed wanted to get this off of his chest and reach out to Dow and let him know the details of that May day in 1863. Ten years later, after he wrote the letter, Reed joined Dow in death. So there you have the story of Neil Dow, Maine, his shooting, and a letter from the man who ordered that shooting. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.